My name is Beth Bardwell, and I work for Audubon, New Mexico, and I'm their director of freshwater conservation. And this talk, you know, we've heard a lot of talk about restoration of riparian habitat on river systems here in, in the West. And this talk is focused on one aspect of that, which is in water limited situations, water limited ecosystems, how do we reallocate some of the water that is currently diverted um, for human use back to nature? And so I'm gonna talk about a innovative partnership between a federal and uh, federal agencies and irrigation districts and nonprofit organizations to do exactly that. And uh, one of my partners, Elizabeth Verdeckia, gave a talk earlier today here in this room and she talked about the overall restoration program and my talk's gonna be focused on the water piece. So just to give a context, and I know um, you may have heard this already, but um, the project is located in southern New Mexico. Primarily, there's a small piece that goes into West Texas. It's the bottom 100 or so miles of the Rio Grande below Elephant Butte Reservoir. This reach has two federal projects overlaid um, on this river reach. And the first one is a reclamation project. It's called the Rio Grande Project. And it irrigates about 178,000 acres between New Mexico and West Texas. 60% of those acres occur in Southern New Mexico. And then there's the International Boundary and Water Commission Rio Grande Canalization Project. That's also on this river reach. And that project has jurisdiction over flood control, but also water deliveries to Mexico uh, in a full supply year uh, on the order of 60,000 acre feet of water is delivered to Mexico at the Acequia Madre just above Juarez. In this reach, there's also two irrigation districts. One of them is New Mexico-based. It's Elephant Butte Irrigation District. We're famous for our hatch chili. Uh, but the three major crops in that district are pecans, alfalfa, and cotton. And then on the Texas side, there's the El Paso, and I'm gonna get this, it's a very long name, I'll probably botch it up, El Paso County Water Improvement District number one. Um, and that's the Texas Irrigation District. And you can see the photo on the uh, top right of this slide is a typical uh, illustration of what this river reach looks like. So it has a uniform pilot channel that was constructed back in the, in the late 40s as part of the Rio Grande Canalization Project. Um, the active floodplain uh, until recently would have been mowed on an annual basis. And then there's levees that, um, you know, to, on that mark, that border, the active floodplain and the, and the irrigated agricultural fields and houses are on the other side of the levee. So, um, Oftentimes, it's really hard to decide where to jump into a story, and uh, it's somewhat arbitrary. So I'm going to jump in um, in 2009. Now, there was a lot of work that preceded that year um, and a lot of partners who helped bring that to bear, including the Army Corps of Engineers. They prepared a conceptual restoration plan for the Rio Grande Canalization Project. But I'm gonna jump in at 2009 where, when the environmental impact statement was finalized and a record of decision was published by the International Boundary and Water Commission. And part of that record of decision um, authorized a change in river management and there was going to be um, what we considered some substantial enhancement of and restoration of native riparian habitat along this 100 or so mile reach of the river. And so that took a number of different um, approaches. One, they were going to, in some places, cease mowing. In other places, they were going to cease mowing and also control for invasive species. And in some areas, they were going to do active restoration. Um, they were actually going to do significant revegetation at these sites. And the record of decision recognized that water was an integral part to restoration. And it was integral in a number of different ways, either because these restored sites were gonna increase depletions, right? We're gonna see an increase in evapotranspiration use of, of these riparian plant communities. Um, 
Sometimes these restoration sites actually needed to be irrigated to sustain um, the riparian habitat that was being restored. And then the record of decision also authorized a restoration flow under certain conditions. Um, and um, that restoration flow, the idea there, um, as um, Andrea was talking about, was to restore hydrological connectivity at some of these restoration sites between the river and the floodplain. Now, two of the species, um, two of the avian bird species that use this river reach um, are threatened and endangered. So southwestern willow flycatcher and yellow-billed cuckoo. And you see there um, on the bottom left is just a hydrograph with um, two bars showing where we would um, contemplate increasing flows in this river reach for overbank and inundation. And what you see there um, is the irrigation hydrograph. Um, this is below a major storage reservoir on the Rio Grande. And so during the non-irrigation season, which used to be um, between roughly September and March, um, they would shut off any releases in this reach of the river. Um, so that's why you see such significant low flows there. And then during the growing season, um, you'd see a spring flushing flow early on, though, like March. And then you'd see a drop um, when they were planting. And then as um, the plants grew and they needed more water, then you'd see these very high sustained flows during the irrigation season kind of the inverse of a natural hydrograph on, on, on a system like the Rio Grande. So, um, so the International Boundary and Water Commission um, recognized that without water, they could not meet their restoration goals. But there were a lot of constraints or impediments um, to moving water from irrigated ag um, to restoration sites or for a restoration flow. And some of those constraints were that in this reach of the river, it's a fully appropriate. There's no more water out there. So if we were going to um, have water available for restoration, it had to be reallocated from existing uses. Um, the other constraint is that the Rio Grande project, this reclamation project, it was one of the earliest authorized reclamation projects in the country, 1905, 1907, it was authorized. It was authorized and still remains authorized for one purpose and one purpose only, and that's irrigated ag. So if we wanted to transfer some of these water rights out of the Rio Grande project or reallocate reallocate them from irrigated ag to these restoration sites, how are we going to address that single purpose authorization. And then finally, um, we knew that some of the species that would occupy these sites, we're hoping are going to occupy these sites, we're restoring these sites to attract them. You build the habitat, they come in. One of the constraints was we might um, increase the number and distribution of endangered species along this river reach. And there was a lot of concern among the irrigated community that yeah, you know, we want to do this. We want to do the right thing, but if we do that, are we actually going to hurt our livelihood down here um, by doing so because of the restrictions on take or degradation of, of habitat of endangered species? So, um, at this point, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the agreement institutional arrangement, just to give you an idea. Um, so the International Boundary and Water Commission um, decided that, you know, now's the time to create this, this program we were going to call the Rio Grande Environmental Water Transaction Program, which would figure out how to, within the existing constraints, reallocate water from irrigated ag to, to these restoration sites. So International Boundary and Water Commission entered into an intergovernmental agreement with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who then grant, gave a grant to National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And you may be familiar with them. I'm, they fund a lot of work across the country, but they have a Western Water Transaction Program. They've been doing amazing work in the Columbia River Basin. They're doing work in the Walker River Basin in Nevada. Um, and uh, they played probably some role, maybe minor, but in, in subsequent um, discussions on the Colorado Delta. So they've been around in the water transaction world for a while. And so um, 
they received this grant from Fish and Wildlife Service and then Fish and then National Fish and Wildlife Foundation put out an RFP, competitive RFP, and Audubon and another group called Ecosystem Economics applied for that and were awarded the contract. So that's kind of the institutional framework of this. Um, but the idea was now we're on the ground and we have to create this Rio Grande Environmental Water Transaction Program. And so um, working with irrigated agriculture, um, there were a couple of kind of sideboards that we had to have on this program. And basically, there was a lot more comfort if we were to be treated like they, they were, if we were to become a farmer. And so we said, all right, well, we're, we'll call ourselves environmental farmers. And so, and they said, that's right. And in fact, you know, this is a whole private um, private property right system. Like farmers, if you want to transfer water right from one farm to another, well, you're going to go out there on the market and you're going to buy it and it's going to be voluntary sales. So that was one of the really important sideboards in getting these irrigation districts on board is we're just talking voluntary sales and we're talking about market-based sales. Somebody could donate their water, absolutely. But for the most part, we're looking at um, market-based sales. Um, we then worked with the farmers to say, well, look, at, um, in some ways, aren't we really like agriculture? Maybe not the in-stream flow piece, maybe not the restoration flow, but when we're applying water on these restoration sites, either passively because they're tapping into existing shallow aquifer groundwater or because we're irrigating them, um, then we're just growing something like a crop. And so we worked with Bureau of Reclamation and the Irrigation District to, to embrace this idea. Um, the final piece was the farmers said to us, look at, you know, like I said earlier, we're worried. We want to do the right thing, but we also don't want to endanger our livelihoods. And in fact, we what really concerns us is we want parity between farmers and uh, endangered species. And what that meant is in low water years, when everybody's sharing shortages within this irrigation district, they wanted these restoration sites to be treated similarly. So they wanted us to share shortages in low water years at these restoration sites, even if they were occupied by breeding federally endangered southwestern willow flycatchers. And then there was also at that, the same time we were putting this whole project together, there was the um, the revised critical habitat rule for southwestern willow flycatcher. And lo and behold, because there was now a lot of attention on this reach of the river, and lo and behold, there actually are flycatchers down there breeding, they were actually included as potentially to be included in, in the crit critical habitat for southwestern willow flycatcher. So of course, the farmers were, were very concerned about this. And they said, look, we're doing this voluntary program. Can we work with you to get this reach excluded from critical habitat designation. So we we set to work and we were successful in accomplishing all of those things. And um, in, Elizabeth said 2013, I, th I guess it was 2013. I kept thinking it was 2014. But in 2013, the irrigation district passed a policy unprecedented uh, in New Mexico, I think it's actually unprecedented in, in any reclamation project in the West, where um, they authorized through irrigation board voluntary suspension and transfer proceedings that you could now reallocate water from irrigated ag to these riparian restoration sites. And so um, here you have the, the vice chair of the board and he's he's saying, look, it's it, you, you may not be growing chili, you may not be growing pecans, but you're growing riparian habitat, and that's an agricultural crop, and that works for us. So while we were working this and developing this institutional framework, um, US IBWC and Fish and Wildlife Service, who uh, San Andreas National Wildlife Refuge is down there, and their staff has been through an intergovernmental agreement and co contract, I guess, helping IBWC, they got to work restoring these sites. So, you know, salt cedar removal, um, burning native trees planted, and then once these water rights are acquired, 
we're going to see these restoration sites irrigated. And Elizabeth spoke about this very, um, very inspiring celebration we had on the river in June 2014 down in Las Cruces, where we had, you know, successfully acquired these water rights and they were delivered to this restoration site. And she had some really impressive before and after photos I'd love to get. Um, so kind of in summary, um, you know, we had two years we've been working on this project. And so we've done a lot in those two years. And this is kind of just a narrative description. Um, but I just want you to know that we developed kind of this institutional framework. We we worked with the irrigation district to adopt these policies. We did a fair amount of fair market evaluation of that water market. What are those water rights worth down there that so that the federal agency knew they were paying fair market value when they were offering to buy these water rights. We put together a water volume, water budget um, for the agency about approximately how much water they might need for these for these restoration sites. And I think the budget, we had a couple of different scenarios, and uh, the budget ranged from 1.2 to 1.7 million dollars, and that's for some fee acquisition, some leasing, um, and some annual assessments that they would pay to the irrigation district once they held those water rights. We also did a fair amount of analysis of transactional approaches and what type of water right holders you might target for acquisition. So we talked a lot about one-on-one -on -one negotiations. We talked about multi-year leases, annual leases, posted offers, reverse auctions, and a special classification of water rights down there called water rights at risk of reclassification. If you aren't able to pay your assessments after a while, the irrigation district um, basically brings a proceeding and those water rights are reallocated. Um, and then we actually tested some pilot transactions. And um, may not sound like much, but um, we acquired six water rights off of six water righted acres. <laughs> and so, but the, the important piece is at this point, you know, the goodwill is more or less intact. We are partnering with the irrigation district and the farmers and the federal agencies. And, and at this point, all of the foundational pieces have been lay, laid and International Boundary and Water Commission is now ready to scale up. And these are the top priorities for water right transfers in the next couple of years. So what are some of the lessons learned um, from this project? Um, I think the first lesson is that, you know, um, a legal hammer is also a two-edged sword. And what I mean by that is a lot of the interest and attention in this river reach came about by virtue of these endangered species that are down there. But it was also a cause for great conflict and concern among the very uh, community and individuals that you were interested in collaborating with. And so there's that balancing act of, you know, how do we get everybody at the table? But now that we have you at the table, we want you to trust us. And so, you know, there's a lot of that negotiation that goes around in building a program like this to make the safeguards there so that farmers who obviously whose livelihoods depend on being able to access the water, um, that they feel comfortable working with these types of restoration programs. Um, difficulty of working in times of scarcity. So, you know, we put this concept together at the probably, you know, around 2009. Well, you know, we all thought that drought would last a couple of years. Well, still here, still with us. And so some of the concepts like the restoration flow, they're still on the table. We haven't figured out how to implement that piece. But if we were, that would we costed it out. We think that'd be about a million dollars a decade. And that would be a lease of water that would ride on top of irrigation releases sufficient that it would inundate as it moved downstream some of these restoration sites. And then there's a block of water that arrives really right above um, El Paso, and most of it hasn't been consumed. And the question is, is who would be the beneficiary of that? Can we think about what the indirect benefits of that restoration flow are in terms of sediment transport, in terms of efficient water deliveries and other benefits to users? And then can we find a downstream user? All to say that the pieces to put together to make something like that work um, still need to be fall into place. 
And then just finally, you know, we got traction on this program because it's at some point the farmers and the conservationists were one voice. And when we were talking to the congressional delegation, we talked as one voice. We had the same goals and objectives. We'd figured out how to move this program forward with the support of working landowners. And that was significant. And I was just um, reading there in, in a, something I read this weekend, a woman who teaches at Harvard Law School, Lori Geekwiener, I'm probably um, not saying her name correctly, but I was really struck by what she said. And she said, you know, the power of collaboration is bringing people bringing together people who bring different kinds of skills to solving a problem. It's not just bringing people who look different than you to the same table and they think like you. That's, that's not what the power of collaboration and diversity is. It's that you bring together people who think very differently about the world to the same table. And it's that diversity um, that can empower creative ways of moving forward and resolving conflict in a water limited world. And just finally, you know, we've been working at this project for such a long time, sometimes you're kind of embarrassed about it. <laughs> you know, like, I've been there for 10 years or 15 years, and this is where we are. But I think the lesson is it just takes an awful long time to change the status quo. And here are some inspiring comments uh, made by the relative, you know, by our stakeholders at our irrigation celebration. Here's a photo of everybody who played some role at some point in bringing this whole effort um, to fruition. And the partnerships, International Boundary and Water Commission, Elephant Butte Irrigation District, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, Audubon, New Mexico. And that's it. So I'll stand for questions. Um, so I have a question about acquiring water rights. And mm -hmm. if there's a limit like if you buy two acres of water rights, can you apply it on one acre of property or does it have to be like one for one? So say you secure one acre foot of water over 10 acres, sure. can you apply that on a smaller area? So um, our rules of allocation are that you have to acquire a base water right for every acre. But in a given year, you may get six inches in annual allocation. And you may say, you know what? I want to pile that water up. That five acres is, is water righted, but I'm going to put all of it on two acres. You can do that. What you can't do is water right. Let's say you have a 30-acre water, 30-acre restoration site. You've water righted five acres of it you and you get your annual allocation you can't spread that water on non-water righted acreage i mean it's the same volume but it's just you know there's certain certain rules you have to abide by and that's one of them and and part of it i think is reclamation trying to keep a handle in the irrigation districts a handle on the number of authorized water righted acreages acreage within a reclamation project because there are contractual limitations. Great. Well, thanks so much. I'll be around.